Hume's problem. Okay. Um, now again, what is Hume's problem? Generally put, what I mean by problem is not Hume's got you know beef, okay, or that Kant's got beef with Hume, or that he's a problematic individual because he was abused as a child or anything like that. I mean the problem of induction. Right? And what is the problem of induction? Again, we talked about that a little bit last time, but you know, this is sort of the, the central thesis about you know, right? You know, let's kind of uh, you know, highlight once again these uh, crucial pages from the preface where, you know, Kant is discussing Hume and the significance of his work um, in relation uh, to his own thought. Sorry, I'm looking for, I, I got my big Kant book today, so in case I want to look at that. Uh, if you were watching last time, you remember I mentioned Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. This is a his, his classic work. Um, as you can see, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, this edition has like 700 pages. <laughs> Big book. Um, anyway, so. What is Hume saying? On the top of page three of the Prolegomena, he challenged reason, which pretends to have given birth to this concept of herself, to answer him by what right she thinks anything could be so constituted that if that thing be posited, something else must necessarily be posited, for this is the meaning of the concept of cause. He demonstrated irrefutably that it was entirely impossible for reason to think a priori and by means of concepts such a combination as involves necessity. We cannot at all see why. In consequence of the existence of one thing, another thing must necessarily exist, or how the concept of such a combination can arise a priori. Skipping over to page four, about a third of the way down there um, in the prolegomena. The question was not whether the concept of cause was right, useful, and even indispensable for our knowledge of nature. For this, Hume had never doubted, but whether that concept could be thought by reason a priori and consequently whether it possessed an inner truth independent of all experience, implying a more widely extended usefulness, not limited merely to the objects of experience. This was Hume's problem. It was a question concerning the origin of the concept and not its in indispensability in use. Okay, so what is Hume's problem? Problem of induction, basically, how can we prove Right? Again, and proof, of course, with necessity. That future event will resemble past events. Right? And, and what this is essentially based upon is a notion of causation or cause and effect. Now, again, what do I mean by necessity? Necessity means demonstrable in an a priori sense, right? Again, that term a priori, that Latin term, term means to acquire, to experience, or, you know, another way of thinking it that kind of links it to the whole rational thing is, you know, in intellect alone. So the idea is this, you know, how do you know that when the cue ball hits the eight ball, the eight ball, the eight ball is going to move? You know, what did we say that Hume basically deduces on this? He says, look, you know it through experience. Um, the rationalists perceive causation, right, as an a priori principle, like an innate idea. Right? Remember, what is, what is, you know, sort of Descartes' big thing? Something cannot come from nothing. Every effect has a cause. It's basically the rationalist way of saying everything has a reason. Okay? Now, don't confuse this with, like, you know, the kind of the greeting card, like, you know, well, everything has a reason for everything. Not like that kind of thing, like you're destined to meet your true love somewhere on a nice beach where there's rocks and stuff. But rather, you know, everything is grounded rational, right? Like, you know, every, everything exists for some kind of, you know, rational, you know, it plays a purposive element in the whole. 
you know, remember, relate this to the whole mechanistic worldview. If the world is a giant machine, right, and that machine is programmed, you know, for specific function, then there's no cog that's there randomly, right? Because a random assortment would, would imply irrationality, <laughs> right? So again, this notion of, you know, the necessary connection of an effect with its cause, you know, is something that the rationals hold to be an a priori, almost like an innate idea of self-evident truth or principle. Hume says, at, in, in actuality, only relations of ideas, a.k.a. mathematical, right, or purely logical um, um, notions, like, you know, either P or Q, not P, therefore Q, right? Like, you know, if you know anything about computer programming language, for example, you know, it's all just based on these just necessary, just purely rational rules, okay? Their truth is guaranteed by the principle of contradiction, the opposite of any relation of idea, like, it, the, like the conclusion that would follow would imply a contradiction, like a married bachelor, for example, right? Okay, but the thing is, what Hume suggests is that every effect is distinct from its cause. Because in phenomenal experience, we see only, remember what Hume said, constant conjunction, A occur, B occur. A occurred, B occurred. Cue ball move, stop. A ball move, right? What Hume is saying is that causation is a subjective method or means that is merely the way in which our mind kind of relates those events to create a kind of a coherent narrative only for the purposes of our experience. But the way that Hume perceives this is that this connection that is made by the mind, right? Let's call it the inferential leap from conjunction to necessary connection is a principle only based upon habit or instinct, right? It is not rational because we can never prove with necessity that an effect will ever necessarily follow from its cause, right? We can only justify that by saying it's always happened now. You know, again, that's the principle of induction. Induction is to make a probable conjecture, high, high, high degree of probability, mind you, right, based upon past events, but you can never establish necessity in the sense of mathematical demonstrative necessity. And to get the significance of this, just consider the whole rationalist methodology, the way that Descartes tries to construct these almost geometrical proofs, right, that he's asserting absolute necessity, right? It's not, you know, the, God exists and the world works the way that it does, and the distinction between mind and body and the primary and secondary qualities. This whole picture of God, soul, reality, mind is based upon this sort of necessary deduction, all taking for granted that causality is part of the a priori innate ideas that yield necessary conclusions. Hume dashes all this to pieces. Causality is not only merely a probable association instead of necessity, but it's even a non rational association because it doesn't come from reason but it comes from habit that's why you know kant is pointing out here he inferred that reason this is page three again was all together deluded with reference to this concept which she erroneously considered as one of her children whereas in reality it was nothing but a bastard of imagination impregnated by experience, not a priori as the you know, rationalist would have it. It is an illegitimate child. The metaphor, this metaphor like cracks me up. Um, uh, and subsumes certain representations under the law of association. And this is the key line here. And it mistook subjective necessity, customer habit, or an objective necessity arising from insight. One way of summarizing this, as, as Kant rightly puts it, you know, huge problem, essentially sort of summarizing this, is the origin of the concept, the book concept here, of causation. Why do I put concept in parentheses? Well, because concepts makes it sound almost a priori and rational, right? But of course, you know, what does Hume say it is? Where does causation come from? 
habit reinforced by constant conjunction of distinct events, making it wholly subjective association. Now you may be thinking to yourself, okay, so what? Let's say that is what causation is. Why should I care? Right? Why should I care? Well, for one thing, I mean, we've already suggested that it's detrimental to the possibility of any future metaphysics. Of course, maybe you're not that into metaphysics anyway. <laughs> you're like, well, good. You know, that's not, that's, and Hume would say, well, that was my point, really. But you can interpret Hume in a little bit more of a, you know, kind of a radical way. Maybe one that Hume didn't entirely intend. Kant kind of alludes to this. Um, when he says that, you know, it's not that the concept of cause was right or useful. You know, we're not asking about whether it's a real thing. We're just, you know, or at least not, that's not our primary motivation. But we're asking about the nature and the origin of causation. But it seems that Hume is almost trying to, in his skepticism, throw out the notion of causality altogether. Right? That's well, just subjective. It's just habit. But wait a minute. Science proceeds on the basis of inductive inferences. And when it makes conclusions about the laws of nature, our fundamental supposition is that the laws of nature are inviolable. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, you can't break a law of nature, right? <laughs> yeah. But Hume would say, you don't know that. You don't know that. Hume is ultimately kind of questioning, look, he would say, look, science is the best means through which we have to understand the world. Don't mistake Hume's point. Hume is on the side of science. Yet at the same time, in his emphasis on, remember what we suggested, human fallibility, he's saying it so, he, he's also suggesting that, but science is nothing more than, at best, a bundle of conjecture. It is only giving us this approximation. At the end of the day, it has the epistemic status of the thing that all philosophers hate, and I've tried to impress this upon you, a belief, a really educated opinion about the way that the world works. But don't we want to say, or at least some people might want to say, that science isn't just an educated guess. It's, you know, theories aren't just like things that like people think, but it suggests something about the way the world actually works. At the end of the day, don't you see how Hume is kind of saying we're all just sort of stuck in our head and we have no idea what's going on out there? And all the associations we make about the world are just based upon nothing more than like an irrational habit or an instinct. <laughs> Not to mention, what does that suggest about human freedom? What does that suggest about human reason? If we're not fundamentally rational, and human beings just operate primarily on the basis of habit and instinct, then what does that say about our will? When we make choices about things, maybe we're not wholly free. Maybe we're just governed by habit and instinct. But what does that say about morality? Well, I shouldn't have killed that guy, but I mean, I guess I'm just the kind of disposition that I get mad at my instincts and irrationality just kind of come over. Oh, well, you know. People are just kind of enlightened animals, so sometimes they do bad things, but what is good and bad? Are there, uh, uh, except for our subjective interpretation of phenomena, right? So you can kind of see that, again, Hume's human nature, his attempts to nat naturalize humanity, may not sit well with theories about, like, well, what about human reason and its superiority? What about morality? What about free choice of the will? What about all, and also, what about science and its attempts to learn actually something? about reality, right? Do you, so, you know, th this is all the stuff that Kant, as, as much as he admires Hume's analysis, and he, and he agrees with Hume three-fourths of the way, he critiques the conclusion. He says, you're right, Hume. Cause is not something that is given in phenomenal experience. The nature of causation is, to some extent, subjective. But I'm not going to follow the skeptical conclusion to reduce causation to habit, lest we condemn humanity to just be unfree, irrational agents that are merely agents of instinct. Kant thinks that we're more than our instinct. Remember, what did 
uh, last time, if you tuned in, you'll remember that I said the, one of the foundational elements of Hume's philosophy is autonomy or freedom. Remember, auto from the Greek self, nomos, law. Human freedom is the capacity to give laws to itself. And if we are nothing more than creatures of habit, following instinct, not really proceeding from commands of reason or will, then how are we self-regulating? We're just a part of nature. And you know, if you want to meditate for just a quick moment, can you see how like when Descartes first postulated this whole mechanistic worldview, that this is kind of an inevitable problem that might happen? If, you know, nature is nothing more than this giant machine that follows these necessary mathematical laws, if human beings are a part of nature, then don't we just necessarily follow predetermined necessary laws and there's nothing else out there? Descartes was wise enough to make the mind exempt from the mechanical web of causality by suggesting it was a distinct substance from nature. Hume says, no, nope. right back into nature. But he goes further and says, but we don't really know what nature is. <laughs> we don't know if it's really a machine. We all, all we perceive is our own subjective viewpoint, and all the interpretations we have of nature are just in our head. So all of these kind of skeptical conclusions makes Kant come along and say, I want to re-examine the possibility of metaphysics, construct a response to the Humean problem, and this is going to be sort of my philosophical contribution. So let's kind of you know, move on a little bit. I know that we're moved on from Hume, but you're, you're going to see how kind of important it is to grasp what Hume is up to, to grasp what Kant is up to. Now, the way that Kant begins is he says, look, we have to sort of consider um, the nature of judgments, okay? Let's kind of understand what it is that we're doing when we are doing something like, you know, metaphysical philosophy or really any kind of philosophy. We need to sort of step back, break it down, and think about the way that human beings think about things. All right? So... You know, last time, and I started talking about this, but I need to talk about it again, right? Kant breaks down into a kind of a table of, of uh, judgment. Sometimes he calls these just propositions. You know, kind of tomato, tomato here. Um, they can be either analytic or synthetic. Also, a priori or a posteriori. Analytic judgments are things like, you know, gold is a yellow metal. All bachelors are married. What is the uh, uh, key theme here? The definition, right, is part of the judgment. Like human relations of ideas, the opposite of any analytical proposition or judgment will imply a What, what, yes, sir. The, so the, the opposite, gold is actually an orange. That's a contradiction. A married bachelor, right? The opposite of any analytic judgment is always going to imply a contradiction, okay? Because the judgments by their essence are definitional, okay? They put another way, they do not amplify knowledge, right? They merely explicate a concept, all right? So they are merely definitional in their nature, all right? Um, hence, all bachelors are married. How do you know all bachelors are married? Because a bachelor is an unmarried man. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's why. It's, it's akin to human relations of ideas. 
All of these are a priori. Why? I don't have to justify these propositions through any kind of empirical evidence. The truth of the proposition is guaranteed by the nature of the concept itself. Okay? So could analytic judgments therefore be a posteriori or, you know, within experience? No, they're by essence a priori. So far, kind of akin to Hume's analysis. Synthetic judgments, right? Steve, the bachelor, lives in a house. How do you know this? Because I know a guy's name Steve. I've learned that he's a bachelor and he lives in a house. Steve and house are not part of the concept of bachelor. What is part of the concept of bachelor? Unmarried, right? You know, this piece of gold weighs five ounces. Okay? We're learning. We're amplifying knowledge. So basically, all judgments about experience are going to be synthetic because synthetic judgments amplify or expand knowledge. And experience is always expanding our knowledge because we're always seeing and learning about new things that go beyond the mere concepts that are only a priori. With me so far? Thus, the last category, so let's just put it this, you know, knowledge Knowledge is expanded or is complicit, amplified, okay? That leaves synthetic a priori judgments. Now, given the definitions of a priori synthetic, um, you know, a synthetic a priori judgment, what would that be? Like, just, you know, break it down for me. What, what would be a synthetic a priori judgment? Well, synthetic judgment is one where knowledge is amplified. A priori is about what is prior to so a synthetic a priori judgment would be one where knowledge is amplified prior to experience. The main question of the prolegomena is are synthetic judgments a priori possible? But notice how, you know, Kant is just, you know, formulating this question in a very, you know, technical way, a precise way. What kind of philosophy wants to amplify its knowledge beyond the bounds of experience? What type of philosophy wants to do that? Metaphysics, especially the rationalists through innate ideas or other kinds of, you know, philosophical wizardry. They want to spin tales about God, freedom, and immortality, and like all of these kinds of things. And again, don't get Kant wrong. Kant's going to say, well, look, you can believe in these things till the cows come home. But as I've tried to stress, are, are you know, rationalists trying to tell you what they believe? They're trying to prove what they think is a priori, absolutely 100% certain. And demonstrable, just like two plus two equals four, they they think they can demonstrate the absolute certainty of metaphysical truths by virtue of reason alone. And what is one of the things that they appeal to to do this? Innate ideas or innate knowledge, right? Kant's main question of the prolegomena and his important critique of pure reason is: Are synthetic judgments a priori possible? If so, how and to what extent? Now, to answer this question, Kant's going to bracket the metaphysics question and leave it aside for now. He doesn't explicitly take up metaphysics until part three of the prolegomena. What he first says is, well, aside from the metaphysical question, are there other types of more common judgments 
that may involve a a priori synthetic element. Put another way, you know, are there other are there kind of judgments that we make that necessarily derive from some sort of principle that is that is that is beyond experience, or maybe maybe put another way, prior to experience to keep the precise connotation of a priori. Kant's going to say, yes, there are. There are different types of knowledge that we use in everyday reasoning that do not derive entirely from experience, as the empiricist would suggest. And what are they? He breaks the main transcendental question, as he puts it. And I'm going to frame it somewhat differently. How are synthetic a priori judgments possible? Why am I saying how now? Because Kant is going to go ahead and say, I'm going to assert that there are. I'm going to prove it. But let's go ahead and say that I'm going to assert that there are certain types of everyday judgments that involve the amplification of our knowledge prior to experience, synthetic a priori. What's candidate number one? Pure mathematics. Here is where Kant gets somewhat interesting. I think he's already interesting, but here's where he gets really interesting. Now, Hume, let's go back to Hume. Hume thought that Mathematics was the prime candidate for what he called relations of ideas. So you put this in Kantian language, that would be the equivalent of analytic a priori judgment or proposition. How do you know 2 plus 2 equals 4? Because 2 means 2. 4 is 2 twos. Addition and equality mean the things that they mean. And if that weren't true, it would be a contradiction. So really, mathematics is nothing more than like, let's put it maybe the way that Hume would conceive it, a conceptual system that exists entirely in the human mind based, nothing other, based upon nothing other than the definitions of all the mathematical principles that make up this kind of self-contained system. That it conforms to nature is kind of a happy accident. <laughs> That we can, you know, understand nature mathematically is good, but the nature of mathematics and its principles per se is really just a kind of a mental exercise of definitions and concepts. Does that make sense? Kant rejects this. Kant thinks that mathematical judgments are synthetic a priori, a.k.a. mathematics does not come from experience. But his whole notion is not going to be like a rationalist innate ideas story. It's going to be something very, very different. But just to begin, we might, you know, have questions and say, well, Kant, I'm with Hume on this. I don't know how you're saying that mathematics and the judgments that we make upon them do not come from experience. What are you talking about? Kant says, well, consider this. 7 plus 5 equals 12. Is 12 contained analytically? In the notion of seven, is it contained within five? Is it contained within addition? Is it contained within equality? Well, is a wholly distinct concept, which is not analytically contained within any of the other elements, you know, because if I say bachelor, the notion of bachelor contains male and unmarried. The notion of gold contains yellowish metal substance. Each number is kind of like its own unique notion. As such, the propositions of mathematics are not analytical because you can't derive previous integers merely on the basis of, or later integers merely on the basis of previous integers. Is it may be somewhat difficult to kind of get Kant's meaning here, but he thinks that, you know, when you do mathematical equations, and, and, and I'm using a simple example, but he says, consider higher order mathematics. This stuff isn't just purely definitional. 
you are expanding your knowledge, with, especially with higher order mathematics like calculus and trigonometry and things like that. This is the expansion of your knowledge. You are amplifying simple definitions way beyond the original implications of their scope. You know, and another way you might think about this is to use an empirical example. You know, Kant would say, look, like if you were to have like five pencils here and seven pencils here, in none of that phenomenal experience is immediately the conceptual notion of either five or seven or 12. That concept, that notion is something that is super added to that phenomenal experience. Right? You know, you take seven things, you get five things, and you put them together, and all you see is like an aggregate. Well, it's like a unifying principle that brings otherwise mere aggregates into a kind of a unity and a comprehension. And Kant's saying that, you know, each number is itself its own kind of unique, unifying notion. Seven and five in no way imply 12 in their analytical concepts. Each is distinct. So mathematics is an amplification of knowledge prior to experience. If you believe him this far, then, then you simply say, okay. If mathematical judgments are synthetic a priori judgments, AKA the amplification of knowledge prior to experience, then the appropriate question becomes, how's that possible? That's what part one of the prolegomena is going to take up. And in so doing, he's going to outline certain capacities of the human mind. Okay, number two. Now this may seem strange. Pure natural science, but wait a minute. I thought science was supposed to be purely, not a priori, but rather, empirical, a posteriori. Isn't everything we learn ab about the world and the scientific judgments and theories that we make about that world, doesn't that all come from experience? Wouldn't you think that? Then why is Kant suggesting that pure natural science involves synthetic a priori judgments, aka judgments that amplify knowledge beyond our experience? Think about it this way. Is causation found in experience? What did we learn from Hume? Causation according to Hume. And here's where Hume's problem comes in. Causation is not found in experience because what do we see in, uh, in uh, experience? Not one thing causes another. Not a necessary connection among phenomenon, but what do we see in experience? A occurs, B occurs. Or, to put it the way that Hume puts it, the constant conjunction of phenomena. Causation is not something that is given in experience. But if it's not given in experience, then that means causation must not be a concept that is a posteriori, a posteriori, it must be a priori. And yet, don't we say that we learn something about the physical world, that our knowledge is amplified when we're learning about the laws of nature and the ordering of the world according to the scientific principles that we understand? Of course we do. So knowledge is amplified. Yet causation is something that seems to not be found within experience, and thus it must be prior to experience. So the question becomes, how is this possible? Notice what sort uh, uh, Kant is sort of assuming here immediately, uh, uh, sort of in, in, in um, contrast to Hume. If natural science is possible, then that means causation can't be merely a subjective principle based upon habit, but must be something that yields actual necessity. 
part of Kant's motivation is to rescue science from Hume's skepticism. Even though Hume saw himself as on the side of science, if he's truly going to reduce the notion of causality to a mere subjective principle of association based upon habit, then in a way, he's sort of destroying the objectivity of something that we use as a regulative heuristic principle to understand the nature of natural phenomena. Hume, maybe it wasn't his intent to do so, but he's like destroyed the objective nature of causality and reduced it to a mere subjective habitual association. Kant wants to say causation is real. It yields necessary connections because if that weren't true, then progress in natural science would not be possible. Because if we were truly wholly ignorant of true causation, then science as we know it, in terms of the understanding of the natural world, would be impossible. Kant wants to rescue science, but you know how he's going to do so? I'll go ahead and give you a hint. Like Hume, he thinks it's not an experience. Unlike Hume, it's not habit, though, but it is a concept that exists within the mind that orders and structures experience in order to make it coherent and possible for us. Yes? It is. But what's the difference between Kant and Hume on this point? Hume doesn't call ca uh, causation a concept, but rather an associative principle reinforced only by habit. AKA Hume reduces cause to something like instinct. It's not something rational. For Kant, it is rational. Causal connections are necessary, Kant will argue, because we could not conceive of a world except as ordered through causal principles. Its necessity, therefore, is grounded not in the objective world that's mind independent, but the necessity of causality is grounded in the mind itself as a necessary principle that makes experience possible for us. The world is causally ordered because our mind structures it that way. And we cannot conceive of a world as non-causally ordered because we could never conceive of a world except through the filter of causation. Put another way, to conceive of a non-causally ordered world would be to conceive of a mind-independent reality. But we can only perceive the world as given to us through the mental categories that structure and organize and make that world possible. Not literally in terms of like what's going on out there. Kant says we can never know what's going on out there. We see the world only as given to us within sensation and as structured and organized according to what he calls the pure concepts of the understanding. I'll, I'll talk. I'll probably talk more about this next time. But for now, I'll you know conclude this part of the discussion, and I want to talk about part one today. Okay. The concepts. Uh, the third part of the book, and finally, after outlining these points that I'm discussing now, he returns to the question of metaphysics, which is the most clear example of pure synthetic a priori judgments. Rather than ask how it's possible, he asks, is it possible? He's going to say, no. <laughs> Very little. Classical metaphysics and rationalism will be destroyed. Because think about what I've already sort of been implying. All knowledge is given to us through the way in which the mind structures and organizes experience for us. Therefore, to conceive of a mind independent reality would be impossible. But to conceive of a mind in independent reality would be to conceive of things like soul, God, the world in, in itself, all the stuff that metaphysics wants. Kant's going to say it's just not possible. But he said, I've reimagined metaphysics 
because the true questions about the nature of reality are not things that exist independent of the mind, but exist as things, concepts, um, or categories within the mind that serve the function of regulating and organizing and ultimately making possible human experience. That's what I referred to last class as the Copernican turn. Kant shifts this, the conversation away from the objective to the subjective. That's Kant's brilliance. On that note, how is pure mathematics possible? Well, Kant's going to tell you. <laughs> He's going to make an argument for you. <clears throat> In order to help elucidate Kant's point, I'm going to begin a chart that I'm going to be filling out. Each section of the prolegomena, one, two, and three, as you can see, deals with a different question. The first one, how is pure mathematics possible? The second one, how is pure natural science possible? The third, metaphysics, is it possible at all? Eh, not looking good. Each part and question is going to be a discussion about the capacities or faculties of the human mind. Kant is going to argue that we have three primary mental faculties. Sensibility, understanding, and reason. By the way, What's the mammoth work called? The Critique of Pure Reason. If each section deals with the respective question, mathematics, natural science, reason's going to be metaphysics. That's what comes critiquing. Reason, reason in its pure use for metaphysics. So each one's going to have a different function. Right now, we're working on sensibility because that faculty is going to correspond to the question of the possibility of pure mathematics. What is sensibility? Hoff describes it as that through which <clears throat> just trying to put this in the record. It is that through which Objects are given or received. Sensibility, Kant conceives of it, like what we would normally think about sensation, but with some important modifications for you know precision and clarity. Sensibility is the mental faculty that receives information. Okay? Pretty simply. It is how we take in data. Anytime data is taken in, though, whether you're talking about the mind or computer, it has to take it, it has to be given in a certain kind of form, right? I mean, you know, it's going to take a certain kind of a, you know, formatted software to be able to run on a certain kind of a computer, because if you're putting the wrong kind of stuff in, it's not going to compute, right? So <clears throat> how is it given? How do we receive information? Kant's word for this is intuition. Kant's word intuition basically means, if I'm going to put it in the most simplified terms, sensation. But he has an interesting way of thinking about sensation. Okay, Since it turns out that sensation need not always be of an empirical origin. I'll describe what this means in a moment. But think about intuition both kind of initially a sensation, so not like a gut intuition, that kind of thing, but like literally like the, 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 the information that's present to your mind immediately. In some ways, it corresponds to human impression, but it's going to be a little bit different. Okay, so intuition, sensation, the data that's present to the mind. It is the form that all objects that are given to the mind 
must necessarily take if they are going to be understood and conceived by the moment. Does all that make sense? I, I stress it because you can see Kant's terminology is all really, really specific. <laughs> okay? And, and getting the terms is going to be part of getting Kant. Now, intuition is going to take itself two forms. There is what he calls empirical intuition. And there is what he calls pure intuition. Let's leave pure on the sidelines for a moment. What is empirical intuition? Things like blue, warm, oh. You know, immediate sense data, akin to Jungian impression. Okay. What Kant is trying to get at in his prolegomena is to ask questions like, how is knowledge possible? How is certain types of knowledge possible? And what is the specific type of knowledge that, he, that Kant is mostly interested in? Synthetic a priori knowledge, which is knowledge that is gained or you know, amplified prior to. He is making the case that mathematics is knowledge that is actually something Mathematical concepts can be amplified without the aid of experience. That is, the origin of mathematical concepts is something that is prior to experience. We made the case by considering, like, you know, we see that 12 is not analytically present in either 7 or 5. There seems to be an amplification of concepts, not merely a relation of ideas in the human sense. How is it possible? Kant says all knowledge must come from some kind of intuition, a.k.a. sense data. Notice how he's kind of erring on the side of empiricism, like he's granting the empirical claim. Where does knowledge come from? Sense. Mathematics, though, is pure. AKA, when he uses that term pure, he means non empirical, AKA, not coming through sensation. So, so think about when Kant uses the term pure, pure is synonymous with non empirical, AKA, not coming through sensation. Okay, but it is the case, you know, thinking about it this way, it is the case that all knowledge that is to be derived must be, must come from some kind of object that is present to the mind, right? Kant's kind of thinking here, something can't come from nothing, <laughs> right? That there has to be some kind of stuff in the mind through which we can derive things. However, if we're claiming, as we earlier did, that mathematics in its pure element is non-empirical, aka a synthetic a priori judgment, then that means the propositions or judgments about mathematics can't come from empirical intuition because then it wouldn't be pure. But since Kant said, Kant says that since um, all knowledge has to come from some intuition, we have to try to figure out if mathematics doesn't come from empirical intuition, then it must come from some kind of pure intuition. But what would a pure intuition be? It would be data that is present to the mind, but is in no way from an empirical origin. Well, Kant says, well, in order to figure that out, if I take away all content from sensibility, then I have nothing more than the form of sensibility. Think about this. What is the very medium of sensibility? What is the medium through which all sense data must be given if it is to be Intelligible. If I take away all contents of the mind and I'm left with nothing other than the form, not the content, but the actual nature of human sensibility faculty, the faculty that receives information, what am I left with? What is in the mind if you abstract all empirical elements? Kant's not going to say, I think there's more anything. He'll say, you know what's left over, what the very form of sensibility is? space and time. Kant is saying, essentially, that all sensations, sense data, must be given through the human mind via space and time. It is the form that all empirical 
sense data in intuition must take if it is going to be intelligible to the human mind. Space and time then for Kant are the necessary conditions for possible experience. You cannot have an intelligible experience if the information that is given to you are not given through the medium of time and space. However, if space and time are the necessary conditions for possible experience, then they cannot be of an empirical origin, but they must be a priori. But if space and time are non-empirical and they are a priori, then what does that say about the nature of space and time? That they are not out there, but rather they are in here. Space and time, Kant says, are empirically real, but they are transcendentally ideal. Space and time exist in the mind as the a priori conditions for possible experience. Because Kant says, think about it, take away all the contents of the mind, what are you left with? Time. You never learn time. The nature of your thought is constructed through time. But time isn't something you sense like color. It's something that is just part of the makeup of the elements of your thinking. Space, something like space may exist out there. But then again, if representationalism is adequate, you remember representationalism, and how we perceive the world is a kind of a conscious reconstruction of that world via sensation given to us in our mind, then if you think about it, all the intuitions or sense data that are present to the mind have to have a kind of a spatio temporal ordering if the world is going to be intuited in an intelligible way by us. So space and time are like the form of the mental faculty of sensibility that takes in sense data and ultimately makes it intelligible and sensible. Imagine conceiving of a world without time. You can't because the very nature of your mind is structured by time. So space and time for Kant are pure intuition that are conditions for the possibility of any experience of the world whatsoever. Therefore, how is pure mathematics um, possible? Because the intuition that math is based upon, aka the stuff that it makes its judgments about, are in the mind as space and time. Think about it. Geometry is the science of pure space. Arithmetic, the whole nature of integers in counting, is predicated upon temporality. One, two, three, four, five. When you carve out an integer and say this is one, you're carving out a slice of time in order to render it coherent and comprehensible. So that means space and time exist within the mind and don't exist necessarily anyway um, outside of the mind. It's time to go, but can you already see what's that going to say about metaphor? Any time that we talk about space and time as though they existed as mind independent realities, is that going to make any sense? I was going to say you can never talk about space and time as though they're mind independent because you can only talk about the world as a possible experience within space and time. How is Kant making a kind of a harmony between rationalism and empiricism? There is stuff that is a priori, like space and time but it only exists to make experience possible, not to utilize for metaphysical mind-independent realities, or as he calls it, things in themselves. We'll take up this discussion a little bit later. Sorry to keep you over a couple of minutes, but I had to make that point. Uh, you get a week off, I will see you after the break. Uh, there will be a reflection uh, and you know, try to think a little bit more about Kant. I might put up some PowerPoints that may take us beyond the scope of this lecture so that maybe in your reading um, to get a little bit of help and also just as you're sort of trying to mull this stuff over, you can kind of see where we're going and you can look at some PowerPoints and that can maybe help you out since you have some time off. Okay, I'll see you guys next time.
I don't have a physical book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or else I wouldn't be turning on a reading question. Right. I want to say 